powerful forces that move along our beaches. They pulse, they flow. Some can appear without warning, turning an idyllic beach setting into scenes of chaos and panic. Then just as quickly, they can vanish. They're masters of camouflage, often hiding tremendous power within seemingly calm waters. Here they wait for the unsuspecting, and there are many. The majority of beachgoers can't recognize their danger. Each year they claim more lives than all our natural disasters combined, and they're responsible for most of our beach rescues. Some people call these deadly forces rivers of the sea, but most of us know them by another name, rip currents. This is a story that will take you beneath the water's surface into the heart of these powerful currents. It's a story about lives that have been forever touched by these rivers of the sea. It was apparent that the people in the water weren't gonna survive if I didn't get them in that boat to the shore as quickly as possible. A community desperately trying to deal with a rip current problem in their own backyard. A dedicated scientist tirelessly working to bring an end to rip current tragedies. In many ways, rips are much more unpredictable and much more dangerous than we ever imagined and heroic people putting their lives on the line to rescue others. The biggest fear that most of us have when we go to the beach is this. A shark attack. But shark attacks are rare. It's rip currents that are far more dangerous. On average, rip currents cause more deaths in Australia per year than cyclones, floods, and sharks combined. All these fatalities occur outside of the red and yellow flags or on unpatrolled beaches. These powerful currents can appear on any beach that has breaking waves. And Australia has a lot of beaches, almost 11,000. Less than 4% of these beaches are actually patrolled by lifesavers or lifeguards. So it's critical that all Australian beachgoers have a good understanding of rip currents. But unfortunately, we don't. Lou Armstrong is a former volunteer lifesaver and competitive ocean swimmer. He thought he knew what to do if he was caught in a rip. But a near fatal run in with a rip current proved that thinking was wrong. We're Lou and Robin Armstrong from northern New South Wales. We've been living here for 20 years. Most Sundays we head on down to the beach for a swim. It's a quite away from the flagged area. But we've been doing this for quite a long time and we're quite familiar with the area. On this particular day, there had been quite a bit of rain around and the water was murky, brown, uninviting, but because we've been swimming here for so long, I felt quite comfortable with going in regardless. I decided to swim parallel to the shore, swimming south, and go for a certain distance and then turn around and come back. Swimming south and had already been in the water for quite a few minutes having a good swim, so I'd used up a fair bit of energy. I suddenly sensed that I was in a different situation that I had never anticipated before, and there was a surge or a current moving off the shore, out away from the shore, which I did not expect. The sensation of that water flow moving offshore was like, um, it was powerful. It was like you were in a river. I'd actually swum myself into a rip current without being aware of it. Lou Armstrong has accidentally swum directly into the path of a fast flowing rip current. His survival now depends on how he responds At one point there, I tried to swim against it, um, which was a fruitless situation. It got me nowhere. It burned up much more energy of what I had remaining anyhow. Um, and I changed tactic and tried to swim 
off to the side of it. With the help of a few dumping waves behind me, I managed to hold my position, but as soon as the wave had, had um, dissipated, I, I was in the same situation. The rip was still taking me offshore at a, at a faster rate than what I could swim either, any direction to try and get out of it. I was exhausted, fatigued. I tried everything I could think of. Uh, none of my tactics worked. Um, I was getting very short of breath. So it was at that stage that the only option I had left was to put my arm straight up in the air and hope that somebody saw it. I was just relaxing on the beach reading my book and I glanced up and I saw Lou wasn't anywhere in front of me. So I looked down the beach and I saw he was a long way out and I realised something was wrong. As I was running out to him, I realised that the conditions were really bad. At the corner of my eye, I could see somebody charging through the waves. It was very dumpy and I could feel the pull of the rip and it was, it was quite terrifying. We both tried to get Lou in and at that stage there was Waves were dumping us and crashing, it, crashing on us. We got him on the beach and laid him on the side, on his side, and just made sure that he was okay and he was breathing. While we were trying to help Lou, somebody had notified the surf club, and a surf lyser came down in a rhino and came over and put oxygen on to Lou. Some oxygen on to you, Lou. Okay, got your head, mate. Relax. All right, the ambulance is on the way. Uh, about 30 years ago, my brother drowned at Mermaid Beach. He got stuck in a rip and he wasn't found for three days. Um, and I destroyed my mum and dad, I really um, broke their hearts and uh, broke my heart too. So I know what it's like uh, for somebody to die that way and I didn't want Lou to go that way, that's for sure. On the beach and definitely during my recovery where I was thinking to myself, how the, did this happen to me? I should have known better than this. After all the time I've spent 20 years and 12 of them with Surf Life Saving Australia and Nippers here and with the local surf club, I should have known better, but there I was in a situation that I never expected in a million years. Lou Armstrong was lucky to survive. If it wasn't for the efforts of his wife and a stranger walking the beach, he would have perished in the rip. But what exactly is a rip current? Well, let me tell you what rips are not. They're not undertow. They won't pull you under because there's no such thing as an undertow. They're not rip tides because they're not a tide. They're a current. They flow pretty steady and they won't take you to New Zealand. Rob Brander is one of the world's leading authorities on rip currents. He's a coastal geomorphologist and associate professor at Sydney's University of New South Wales. Okay, so we came down and this looked like a pretty safe place to swim, right? For over a decade, Rob has been on a personal mission to teach the public about rip current survival. Around the world, Rob Brander is known as Dr. Rip. People do get scared. Every summer, 
Rob can be found on Australian beaches, releasing a harmless coloured dye into the water as part of his public education campaign. Within seconds, the purple dye reveals a lurking rip current. The simplest way to describe rip currents is that they're strong, narrow, seaward flowing currents that extend from the shoreline out beyond the breaking waves. And they exist to bring all that extra water that's coming in with the breaking waves back offshore. And all of our recent research has shown that rips are incredibly complex and they're much more unpredictable and dangerous than we could ever have imagined. Many of Australia's rip current incidents take place on isolated stretches of coastline where the nearest patrolled beach is neither close nor convenient. But there are just as many drownings that occur within several hundred metres of patrolled beaches, and one of the nation's most popular stretches of coastline is not immune to the problem. The Gold Coast, Australia's holiday playground. It's known throughout the world for its beautiful coastline and stunning beaches. Every summer, millions of beachgoers take to its Pacific surf. Stretching out over 50 kilometres, this incredible coastline is also one of the nation's safest. Lifeguards and lifesavers work tirelessly to keep swimmers safe between the iconic red and yellow flags. But many locals and tourists swim outside of these designated safe zones. This can be a tragic mistake. It's a typical summer's day. A family enters the surf just 100 metres outside of an area patrolled by lifesavers. Within minutes, the young boy discovers he's being pulled away from the beach. He tries to swim back to the shallows, but he can't make any progress. Panic sets in as he struggles against a force that seems determined to drag him out to sea. Lifesavers see the struggle in the distance and immediately respond. This rip current encounter ended without tragedy, but sadly, every year many lives are lost on Australian beaches because of rips. All of these tragedies occur outside of the red and yellow flags. Many of these incidents could have been avoided if people were able to recognise the signs of an operating rip current. But 70% of Australian beachgoers don't know how to spot a rip. The best way to spot a rip is to look for dark gaps. Right behind me, we've got a nice rip. It looks like a dark gap, almost like a road or a path going through the surf. Now over here, it's a shallow sandbar. The waves are breaking. All that white water is piling up on the beach starts flowing along the beach in this deeper channel and then turns the corner and that's your rip. And that's what you look for, dark gaps. Young males between the ages of 15 and 39 are the most likely to die in rip currents. So Rob focuses many of his talks towards younger children hoping that his beach safety information will help influence their future decisions. Today we've got big waves all up the beach, it's big waves. No one's going to be swimming up there. If they want to go for a swim, they're going to come down here where it's nice and flat and it looks really safe. This looks like the safest part of the beach today. But there's actually a really strong rip current. And this is why they're dangerous, because most people, including Australians, don't know what rips look like. The majority of rip current drownings take place underneath bright blue skies and what appear to be perfect beach conditions. There are many different kinds of rips and scientists estimate that up to 17,000 rip currents may be operating along Australia's beaches at any given time. The most common type is a channelized rip. These rips occupy deep channels between sandbars and they can stay in the same place for days, weeks and even months. Then there's boundary rips, which can also be channelised and are found against headlands and other structures reaching out into the ocean like piers and jetties. But one of the most dangerous and unpredictable rips is the flash rip. 
we've just had an example of a flash rip where all of a sudden the rip is pulsed out where those surfers are. You can see the, the chopped up, messy white water that's just gone out and then it's just stopped. And that's one, one common thing about these flash rips is that they can suddenly occur anywhere where there's suddenly been a large group of waves breaking and it pushes the rip out and then it disappears. And then it might come up a bit further down the beach, it might come back 10 minutes later. And those are the really dangerous rips because you can't, it's difficult to see them and it's difficult to predict when they're going to occur. Bondi Beach, February the 6th, 1938. It was a sweltering hot day and tens of thousands flocked to the famous beach for relief from the relentless heat. At 3 p.m., a sudden increase in the size and frequency of the waves created a massive flash rip, instantly pulling hundreds of bathers out to sea. Lifesavers scrambled to assist. 250 people required rescuing. 35 were pulled from the water unconscious and tragically, five people lost their lives. It remains one of the darkest moments in our beach safety record books. A day now called Black Sunday. Rip current incidents are a major problem for many coastal communities and one that a beachside town in northern New South Wales is struggling to deal with. A problem highlighted by a tragic event. Fingal Head, northern New South Wales. This small beachside community has a permanent population of just 600. But in the summer months, the numbers swell as tourists fill the caravan parks. Its surf beach is patrolled by lifesavers. But this isn't the beach that many locals and tourists are visiting. Less than 800 metres to the south, and on the other side of the headland, is Dreamtime Beach. This stretch of coastline is unpatrolled by lifesavers or lifeguards at its northern tip, and is considered a highly dangerous location, notorious for rip currents. But every summer, tourists and locals take to its unpredictable waters. It's a high-stakes gamble that has led to many near drownings and, sadly, some fatalities. Good Friday, March 25th, 2016. Dreamtime Beach was busy as people took to the surf to enjoy the long weekend. Seven-year-old Rihanna is playing in shallow water while her mum watches on. Without warning, a large set of waves sweeps Rahana off her feet and into deeper water. Within seconds, she's being pulled away from the beach. It's a flash rip, and Rahana is firmly in its grip. Her mother races to help. But the pounding waves are relentless, pushing her back towards the beach. Ryan Martin hears the screams and runs into the water, heading straight for Rihanna. Exhausted, Rahana's mother is barely able to stay afloat. She's beginning to drown. Raymond Williams sprints across the beach to help the mother. pulls the mum back to the safety of the beach. He saved her life. The rip current is now pulsing, pulling Rihanna further out to sea, each wave blanketing her with water. Ryan Martin was once a volunteer lifesaver, and he's drawing on all of his water skills to reach Rihanna before she disappears from view. When Ryan reaches Rihanna, she desperately clings to him. She's consumed with fear, and Ryan knows that he must find a way to calm her down. Alone and increasingly isolated, 
Ryan is fighting to keep Rihanna afloat and safe. But the heavy effort is taking its toll. He's becoming exhausted. More help is coming. Luke Robinson has raced down from the headland and starts the long swim out to Ryan and Rihanna. When he reaches the pair, he urges Ryan to head back to shore, but Ryan refuses to leave the young girl. Together, Luke and Ryan work to keep Rihanna afloat, taking turns to support her weight. Levi, a local surfer, is now in the water and frantically paddling towards them. Ryan is so fatigued that he can barely keep himself afloat, but he continues to support Rihanna. Yet another surge of water rolls over the top of them, pushing Ryan beneath the surface. When the water clears, Ryan is gone. When Levi arrives, he can see only two people in the water, and his surfboard becomes their life raft. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Rihanna and Luke are now semi-conscious, swallowing water, almost unable to hold onto the board. In the distance, Levi can see a rescue boat racing towards them from Finglehead Surf Lifesaving Club. Among the crew is Steve Kudzius. The vision that I saw is something that you would never want to create ever again. It all unfolded. A sense of silence came over. The crashing waves seemed like they stopped. The lifeless, or semi-lifeless people in the water, the, the look of distress on people's faces is absolutely gut-wrenching. Luke and the young girl didn't have a lot of time left. But once they fell unconscious, I knew it was a race against the clock to be able to save their lives. When I got them to the beach, they started to, to vomit and, and show signs of life again. At that point, members of the public assisted and um, they survived. I returned immediately to find Levi had found Ryan and was holding on to Ryan as best he could. So I picked up Ryan and returned him to shore and did all I could to revive him. But we weren't successful. Ryan's family have struggled with their loss. They live now with the memory of what Ryan sacrificed to help a young child caught in a rip current. He sacrificed his own life so that someone else, so he could save someone else, a stranger that he didn't know. Um, and I don't think there's any bigger sacrifice than that. And that's, that is hard for us as a family because we want him here, but I don't think there's any, there's no better definition of, of bravery than what he had done. Many people were heroes that day. Without their combined efforts, more lives would have been lost. But if it wasn't for the bravery of Ryan Martin, who was first in the water, Rihanna would certainly have drowned. He was absolutely a hero. Rob Brander is a scientist, a husband and a father and is deeply affected by any news of rip current fatalities. These heartbreaking stories drive him on to understand more about how these deadly currents operate. To get inside the heart of rip currents, Rob uses GPS technology. These instruments are mobile devices called drifters. And when placed in a rip current, their onboard GPS units record data that helps Rob and his team understand more about what these currents are doing. O 
Over the last decade, these experiments have recorded hundreds of hours of data across multiple beaches, and the research has revealed some astonishing information. Data from the GPS drifters has revealed so much variation about how rip currents actually flow. And really, it's changed everything about what we thought we knew about rip currents. To understand the significance of this research, it's important to know why rip currents form in the first place. To be able to form, rip currents need breaking waves. It's the spatial variation in the breaking waves, normally caused by undulations in the sandbars, that commonly begins the process of a rip current forming. A flow develops that moves from the region of intense wave breaking toward the region of reduced or no wave breaking inside the surf zone. This flow is the pathway of least resistance for outgoing water. The water flowing out along this channel is the rip current. Our research with the GPS drifters helps us measure and understand both flow direction and flow speed, both inside the surf zone and outside the surf zone. The drifter data shows enormous variations in rip current flow patterns. Sometimes the rip flow exits well beyond the surf zone, out into deeper water. Sometimes it recirculates within the surf zone, but also that there's dramatic variations in both the flow speed and the direction in incredibly short periods of time. The average rip current flows off short speeds of about half a meter to one meter per second, but they all have a tendency to pulse. And what that means is that suddenly the rip current can just dramatically double its speed in a matter of 30 seconds. And then you're talking speeds of two meters per second, which is literally Olympic swimming speeds. All this research has revealed that rips are far more complex and at times far more dangerous than we could have ever imagined. For Rob Brander, this information is critical to helping him answer a key question. What's the best way to get out of a rip current alive? It's a question that Lou Armstrong was faced with when he was caught in a pulsing rip current. On that day, Lou tried everything he could think of to escape the rip. He tried to swim against the flow. He attempted to swim parallel to the beach in both directions but this strategy also failed to get him out of the rip. Totally exhausted, Lou was beginning to drown and almost certainly would have perished if not for the efforts of his wife and a brave bystander. What else could Lou have done? Was there another escape strategy that would have released him from the grip of that powerful rip current? It's a question that Rob hopes his research can answer. Rob Brander has committed his life to rip current research and he won't rest until he can answer a question that has puzzled scientists for decades. What's the best escape strategy to get out of a rip current? So one of the problems with rips of course is that no matter what you do people will always get caught in rips and you have to tell them something about what they should do. And one of the traditional pieces of advice that's been around for a long, long time is if you get caught in a rip, you should swim parallel to the beach. It's been there for ages. But is that true? Is, is that one single piece of advice going to work in all situations? And what our research has shown is that no, that's not true. And we've got to the point now through our experiments is that we, we have a much better understanding of what we should tell people to do when they get stuck in a rip. This understanding has come through repeated experiments that required Rob and his research team to swim in different rip currents with GPS attached to them and to compare the results back to the data collected from the GPS drifters. This training exercise explains how this is done. All right, so what we're gonna do now is test what you should do if you get stuck in this rip. And we're gonna try three scenarios. So I'll just draw it in the sand. We've got the beach here. This is the rip essentially going like that. We're all gonna walk in together to about that spot there. Somebody's gonna swim parallel that way. Somebody's gonna swim parallel that way. Somebody's just gonna float. And somebody's gonna swim against the rip back to the beach. So that's the four scenarios that we've got. Typically, rip currents are about 10 to 50 meters wide. 
and they can flow anywhere from 50 to 100 meters offshore normally. But we've measured rip currents that have flown 400 meters offshore. It's never a good idea to actually try and swim against the flow of a rip current. In most cases, these rip currents are flowing about half a meter to one meter per second, which is faster than most people can actually swim. So if you try swimming against that, you're just not gonna make any progress whatsoever. We've also seen in our experiments that rips can pulse or accelerate and flow. So they can suddenly double in speed to about two meters per second. And even the best swimmer is just not gonna make any progress at all against that rip. Swimming parallel to escape a rip can often work. In many of our experiments, there was a really high success rate of getting out of the rip. But it didn't always work. And the reason for that is because not all rip currents flow straight. And a lot of rip currents are these rotating eddies. Now, depending on when you try and swim parallel to get out of that eddy, you might find yourself actually swimming against that eddy circulation, which makes it really hard. The other option to escape a rip is just to stay afloat. And that makes sense because you're conserving energy and you can still put your hand up to signal for help. And what we found is that a lot of these channelized rip currents will flow in these rotating eddies. So if you get stuck in that rip current, that eddy flow will take you around and into shallow water where you can likely stand up and the waves are breaking. And you can use those breaking waves to get back to the beach and back to safety. The problem is that the average time for a rip current to recirculate you back into shallow water can be on the order of a couple of minutes to up to 10 minutes. And that's an awfully long time to expect somebody to stay afloat and to stay calm. The other problem is that if you stay afloat in a rip current that actually flows well beyond the surf zone, you're gonna get stuck out there. And you only have two options. One is that you're gonna get rescued or you've got a long swim one way along the beach and then back in. And that's a long swim and there's no guarantee that when you come back in that you're not gonna find yourself swimming against another rip current. Rob's research has revealed that there is no single escape strategy that is guaranteed to get you out of a rip current. Instead, you have options based on the conditions and the behaviour of the rip. The golden rule is to never attempt to swim against the current. Remember to stay calm and focus on floating. Just go with the current and raise your hand for help. Depending on the flow of the rip, floating will normally deliver two scenarios. A circulating rip current should float you back around to either a sandbank or put you close to breaking waves, which will help you get back to shore. A current that flows directly offshore will normally float you just beyond the breaking waves where the rip will cease to operate. At this point, you can either continue to float and wait for rescue, or you can swim around the rip and back to shore. The other option you have, and this applies only to good swimmers, is you can try swimming parallel to the beach in either direction as you float with the current. In some situations, this may free you from the rip. Rob Brander's research has highlighted just how unpredictable these currents can be. The one factor that we have control over may in fact be the key to our survival in any rip encounter. Killer when it comes to rips. Rips don't drown you, they don't pull you under, but panic, panicking will drown you. And people panic because they, they find themselves being taken quickly offshore, the situation is outside of their control, it's a scary experience. And, and what you need to do when you're caught in a rip is just sort of try and take control of the situation yourself. You can, you can float and you can assess what's going on. Do you want to swim this way? Do you think that will work? If it's not working, float a bit, swim the other way, or just float. But if you're constantly thinking about the situation and thinking about the different options you have, you're in control of the situation, assuming that you haven't exhausted yourself. But you do not want to panic. Anything that will eliminate the panic response is the best approach. Not panicking when caught in a pulsing rip current may be easier said than done, but your survival could just depend on it. Even the very fit can quickly find themselves in serious trouble when panic sets in. And it's not uncommon for someone to drown within 60 seconds of being caught in a rip. Panicking when caught in a rip current sets off a chemical chain reaction. The nervous system moves into a flight or fight response and floods the body with adrenaline. 
Consumed with fear, the swimmer often attempts to fight against the current, and this futile effort leads to a massive increase in heart rate and oxygen consumption. Fatigue is taking over as the swimmer scrambles to stay above the water's surface. Each intense effort leads to greater amounts of lactic acid flooding the body, causing muscular shutdown. The lack of oxygen is reducing brain function, and with this, the ability to make good decisions. Further struggle leads to total exhaustion. In less than one minute, a life can be lost. Nearly all rip current tragedies could be avoided if people didn't place themselves in harm's way to begin with. Complacency, coupled with a lack of skills to identify rip currents, remains a critical beach safety issue for people choosing to swim outside of the red and yellow flags or on unpatrolled beaches. Clearly, these are factors that have contributed to the history of rip current incidents along Dreamtime Beach. And now the Fingal community have decided this issue must be addressed. OK, what are the main rules that we talk about when we go to the beach? And together, they're taking action. It's been 12 months since the tragedy occurred at Dreamtime Beach that claimed the life of Ryan Martin. Tourists and locals continue to swim along this unpatrolled stretch of coastline, and there have been dozens of rip current rescues over the summer. For Steve Kudzius, the events that unfolded on Good Friday 2016 have affected him deeply. He and his crew saved lives on that day, but the emotional experience has left him struggling with post-traumatic stress. Despite this, he has been heavily involved in bringing members of the small community together to tackle the issue of rip current safety along the northern end of Dreamtime Beach. It's a grassroots approach to a local problem. And the town's indigenous community have embraced the opportunity to be involved. Fingal is home to the Jirikai Surf and Culture Group, an indigenous organisation committed to helping Aboriginal kids be actively involved in surfing and surf lifesaving. The organisation was named in honour of the Bundjalung Nation member, who in the early 1900s was renowned for carrying out daring surf rescues. Joel Slab coordinates the group and runs the beach safety program. Jurikai, along with other members of the community, have been involved in dozens of rip current rescues along Dreamtime Beach. OK, so let's talk about rips. Woodra, um, what's the best way to spot a rip? It's usually like real messy and like real sucky, like sucks out to the back of the ocean. You see the water stand up and you see a bit of sand in the wave. What happens usually at the end of a gutter? Um, oh, a rip. A rip, yeah. Why is that? Does anyone know why the rip form at the end of gutters? The water like fills up in the gutter and then it gets, has to go somewhere so it goes out. Yeah, it finds its easiest way out. Steve has invited Rob to Fingal to share his knowledge about rip currents and to see firsthand the significant issues that the community is facing. So the patrol beach with the surf club is on that side of the headland, but everyone comes here. So, what, so why do they come here? A northerly wind. This is absolute paradise down here. Well, appears to be paradise until, as you can see now, there's a, a two flash rips, nearly three in a row here, yep. starting to draw out, and they sort of fill into a gutter and the gutter takes it around the headland. That's why headlands are so dangerous, because in this case, if you've got, like today, if you've got a wind coming from the south, it's going to push the water up and, and push it out against the headland. And the opposite conditions, when it's from the northeast, even though this is protected, the waves are going to be breaking out there, and the water is going to gradually move up this way and, and out again. So you're going to have a rip here no matter which way the waves are coming from. Most of the loop locations almost tee up where a lot of the ramps so the beach are a lot of the public access. It's a classic situation, right? You're just setting up people to get in trouble in rip currents, and there's no one there to save them. But you guys have done some rescues. How often are you doing that? Look, as a, as a local community, it wouldn't be 
shy of maybe one a week between us all that we're doing a rescue here. Wow. Two weeks ago we had a mass rescue where six kids and three adults were caught in a rip and it was only by the swift actions of a few of our local surfers um, that we uh, that they managed to get home to their parents and, and, and fathers got back to their wives that night. When meeting with the Jurakai group, Rob learns that not only have they saved many lives through daring rescues, but their beach safety education program is truly unique. So you could come across someone, a rock fisherman that's been swept off the rocks at the lighthouse. What's the first thing you're going to do? Get a lifeguard. First thing you should do is have a look and see if they've got an esky, empty their esky, throw it down to them. At that point, you've given them something to hold on to until you go and get a, 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 someone to help them. If you see someone in a rip, they're going to be swimming towards the beach against the rip most of the time. So if you can throw in a flotation device to them, that flotation device will get to them in time. So do that before you go and get help because that little bit of flotation buys them time. So Rob, with these sort of programs that we run, we look at trying to educate the kids to if they can identify a rip, to let families know when they're on the beach that they're swimming in a dangerous spot. It's hugely important to prevent rather than, you know, go in the water and sort of save someone. With so much of our coastline on patrol, we just can't rely on lifeguards and lifesavers to be everywhere. And what impresses me the most about what the Fingal community is doing is that not only are they educating themselves, they're educating other beach users. So really, they're citizen lifeguards, which I find incredibly inspiring. What else makes that rip dangerous? At dream time, yeah? The rip makes it dangerous because it's... The Bundjalung Nation has a special connection to the waters of Dreamtime Beach. They believe that it's their duty to help keep Dreamtime Beach safe, just as Jurakai did a hundred years ago. This dance symbolises a passing of the baton from one generation to another, as these kids and young adults follow in Jurakai's footsteps and continue his work as citizen lifeguards. On another beach, Lou and Robin Armstrong reflect on the day when Lou almost lost his life to a powerful rip current. He tried everything he could think of to escape the pulsing rip, but nothing worked. What else could Lou have done to help his situation? We know now, through Rob Brander's research, that Lou's next best option would have been to just conserve his energy, not to panic, and focus just on floating with the current. If the current was a rotating eddy, this strategy would likely have floated Lou back around to a sandbar and shallower water, where he should have been able to stand and then use the breaking waves to get back to the beach. If the rip current was flowing beyond the surf zone, Lou would have floated just past the breaking waves. At this point, Lou could either continue floating and wait to be rescued, or if he wasn't too fatigued, he could attempt to swim up or down the beach to get away from the rip and then back to shore. To this day, Lou remains forever thankful to a total stranger who bravely entered the water and helped save Lou's life. The other rescuer was Peter and the amount of work and effort that he put in to help Lou bring Lou in was amazing and he is our hero. Storm and it disappeared, and it came back last year, and then it's gone again. In Sydney, 
Rob Brander continues his tireless campaign to save lives with rip current education. So when you go to the beach, you look for these dark gaps. The other things you look for is the water being bumpy. So rips take water offshore, waves bring it back in. So the water comes together and it makes this bumpy and ripply surface. Dr. Rip has been giving these talks now for well over a decade. His goal has always been the same, to get everyone to think more about rip current safety every time they go to the beach. It's a message that he can see as connecting with more families and more kids. Put it this way, you don't cross the road without looking both ways. At least I hope you don't. And you do that automatically. So you should never go to a beach without spending five minutes looking for a rip current or looking for the flags. Because if you take those five minutes, you look for all this stuff, that means you're thinking about rips and you're thinking about the safest place to swim. You have to spend that five minutes, it's so important. Rob Brander's quest to help save lives on Australia's beaches began that day so many years ago when he saw someone die in a rip current. Since then, he hasn't stopped believing that his education programs can make a difference. With over 11,000 beaches on our doorstep, Australia will always be an aquatic nation, and rip currents will always be the number one beach hazard. For every story of a successful rip current rescue on an unpatrolled beach, there are too many others where lives were needlessly lost. Sometimes it's the life of a bystander who bravely entered the water to help someone in distress. Swimming between the red and yellow flags is always the safest option. But not all beaches have flags, so it's just as important for all Australians to understand rip currents, to know how to spot them and what to do if they ever find themselves in the grip of a rip. Demilavo's family, and this is my daughter, Rihanna, who was saved on that day at Dreamtown Beach in Fingal. We would like to thank everyone who was involved in that um, incident on that day. Thank you for helping to the lifesavers of um, Fingal Heads, and especially to the people in there who was helping. Thank you, especially to Ryan Martin's family. We thank you, we all your, um, our daughter's life to Ryan Martin. We couldn't thank him enough for what he did. He's truly a true hero in our family. And it, he was so brave enough for what he did. We'll make sure that he's always be remembered as a hero to our family. Thank you. 